discussion is skeletal dysplasia. There is a lot of misunderstanding between what is a dysplasia. Today's uh, topic for discussion is skeletal dysplasia. There is a lot of misunderstanding between what is a dysplasia and what a dysostosis is. And then these are all mostly congenital or developmental in origin. Let us see a working uh, hypothesis and analysis of various dysplasia or dysostosis. Dysplasia means, for our understanding, a disturbance in bone structure or modeling which assumes disturbance in growth intrinsic to bone. Whereas, dysostosis is malformation of individual bones, either single or in combination of other bones. Now, let us see the sclerosing bone dysplasia. That means, where on radiology alone, you can see mostly density rather than osteolysis. And these dysplasias include endochondral bone formation affecting primarily the sponges of the bone. These include osteopetrosis and again in osteopetrosis there are two major forms, the recessive and then dominant. The second form is pycnodysostosis. Osteopetrosis means pathologically overproduction of cartilage cords and excess mineralization or deposition of calcium phosphate crystals. And then it is a typical picture of osteopetrosis in a child. Typical in the sense, look at the bones. All of them are dense and then in the development or in the modeling, the chest thoracic cage looks like a dumbbell. And these are the ephemera. Look at the modeling deformity, the so called Erlenmeyer flask deformity. The tubulation is not there, this is the under tubulation, and yet the bones are dense. Look at here. Again, there are growth spurs in children. So sometimes you get a bone in a bone, or at the ends of the growing bones, it will be much denser, whereas at the diaphyseal ends, they are not that dense. Often, fractures are not uncommon in osteopetrotic bones because they are brittle. They are, although they are marble, they are dense, but yet they are brittle. So, fractures are not uncommon. And also, look at the iliac bone, a ring within a ring because these are growth spurs in an adolescent. And then we come to the pycnodysostosis. One thing I forgot to tell you is in osteopetrosis, the cranial bones are also involved including the ossicles. That is how sometimes they come with deafness or because of the optic foramen or stenotic, they may come even with blindness. I remember that uh, from Walker Town, there was a family, it was in 1957, that the one child came with autosclerosis and deafness, another with progressive blindness. Now we come to pycnodysostosis. It is a hybrid uh, type of term between osteopetrosis, namely marble bones, and cleidocranial dysostosis. The classical features to differentiate from osteopetrosis, osteopetrosis was said diffuse dense bones, whereas here also you get density of the bones, sclerotic bones. But then the differentiating features are one, if you look at the mandible, normally the angle of the mandible is acute, whereas here it is obtuse. Almost you can draw a straight line from the mantis to the temporomandibular joint. Second important feature is the so called sandwich type of vertebra. Generally you see this in renal osteodystrophy and other conditions. Look at the central spongiosal bone which is lucent and the either end, articular ends of the bones, then sense sclerotic. And we said it is a hybrid between cleidocranial dysostosis and osteopetrosis. Look at the hypoplastic clavicles. They are hypoplastic, sometimes they may be completely absent too. And the most important feature is acroosteolysis. Look at the terminal phalanges. Some of them are tapered, some of them have lost their tufts. This is another classical example of pycnodysostosis. Here, there is no density of the bones. There is no sclerosis of the bones. 
and yet if you look at the clavicles they are hypoplastic and middle and lateral thirds are absent this is classical of pleido cranial dysostosis and then the radiological features include dysplastic or even absent clavicles vermian bones in the skulls midline defects including the spine the cranium and the symphysis pubis acroosteolysis which i have described just now and then defective femoral heads accessory ossification center at the base of the second metacarpal somehow you find this normally also less than 1% of the normal people also you may get but this is added to the other features this is a classical example of pleido cranial dysostosis and then we come to this entity can anybody guess what this is is the lateral spine and then look at the pubic symphysis i will give you the, a close uh, sample of the pubic symphysis also look at the defective necks of the left particularly the left neck of the femur close view of the pubic symphysis defective mineralization the articular margin is not present this of course is another in a child in an infant actually the defects in the symphysis pubis and hypoplastic hips again another example of pleido cranial dysostosis right clavicle is almost absent left clavicle is just hypoplastic again look at the symphysis pubis absent and if you look at the hips grossly there may not be much uh, defect but if you look closely there is some hypoplasia and then we come to the another entity where the bones are affected particularly in the secondary spongiosa one is anastosis anastosis when it is localized any tubular bone can get the anastosis endosteal thickening and the cortical sclerosis is seen then osteopoikilosis those uh, so called spotty bones and it may be generalized or systemic or they may be localized with where we call it bone island or insular compact a big latin name for telling that the compact bone has taken a place in the spongiosa looking like a bone island and then osteopathia striata instead of these oval type of bone islands we get striated type of appearance in the long bones that's why it's called osteopathia striata and then the arrows obviously show the several bone islands and one important uh, major finding in osteopoikilosis is all these spotty bones are near the articular ends if you take any joint on either side of the joint you find these mostly another pelvis you could look uh, look into the sacrum or in the femora or in the acetabulum multiple bone islands rarely these bone islands may get uh, malignant very rare one or two cases are there in the literature same thing in the feet multiple bone islands this is the osteopoikilosis or spotty type of bones and the axial skeleton is not exempt although these bone islands or osteopoikilosis much more common in the tubular bones and pelvis but spine is also seen again note the arrow pointing out a bone island look at the hands bilateral symmetrical bone islands and in a close look look at the nice bone islands on either side of a joint they may be in the shaft too but mostly distribution is on either side of a joint again pelvis diffuse sometimes they are scattered paucity of these are noted sometimes numerous bone islands are seen next entity is osteopathia striata as we said earlier striated appearance linear longitudinal as if you had run a taken a chalk piece and drew lines again the distribution is on either side of the joint and then we come to the next entity called the piles disease or familial metaphyseal dysplasia also sometimes it is familial frontometaphyseal dysplasia 
again you notice modeling deformities of the bones involving mostly the growing ends of the tubular bones. Look at the, the knee joint, the femora, look at the lack of modeling of the lower end of the femur and upper end of the tibia. Same thing in the shaft of the femur. Similar, look at the humerus, lack of modeling and widening of the proximal end of the humerus. Notice the medial end of the clavicle, again that is widened. Notice the posterior ends of the ribs like a spatulate, cylindrical widening of the posterior ends of the ribs. Here it is a mild variety, look at the lower ends and the proximal ends of the both bones of the forearm, again lack of tubulation. Now we come to the progressive diaphyseal dysplasia where it is called the Engelmann Camerati disease. Again there is sclerosis, but where is the sclerosis? Not at the growing ends of the bone, in the diaphysis and it is bilateral, symmetrical, fusiform type, expansion and periosteal reaction along mid shafts of the long tubular bones is noted. And at times sclerosis of the base of the cranium and vault of the skull is also noted. Forearm bones, look at the diaphysis widened. Sometimes you can see in the growing ends of the bones, metaphysis, no periosteal reaction at all. Whereas in the diaphysis, you see diffuse periosteal reaction. And ultimately, this periosteal reaction blends with the cortex, with the diaphysis of the cortex. That's why the, there is a widening of the bone. Next, we will come to the meloosteosis, flowing osteosis or hyperostosis in the bones. They are linear, segmental, flowing hyperostosis corresponding to sclerot sclerotomes. And occasionally, you may see even the skin changes in this entity. Hyperostosis skips joints. Sometimes, it, it, although we, as we see as it flows, along the tubular bones, in the, near the joint you may not be able to see, sometimes. And a, a heterotopic bone in soft tissues, new bone is seen in the soft tissues as if it is a calcification. And at times if it is attached to the bone, it looks like an osteochondroma. Classical example of, look at the, it is not osteopathia striata, striata is just linear, whereas here, candle dripping appearance, or dripping candle appearance. You notice flowing air prostosis. Similarly, in the foot as well as in the knee joint, in the knee joint, look at posteriorly, diffuse irregular homogeneous type of calcification as though it is attached to the bone. Then, if we didn't notice the rest of the bones, we would think it is an osteochondroma or an exostosis. Again, notice the first metatarsal, the flowing air prostosis, skips the joint and then enters into the phalanges. And then as we said earlier, the localized form of melanosteosis is anastosis, just a sclerosis at the uh, medial end of the radius, just a localized segment, maybe one centimeter or two centimeters. That should not be mistaken for osteoid osteoma or osteomyelitis or periostosis. Similarly, it, does, it skips the joint, lower end of the humerus, as well as the upper ends of the radius and ulna. And the hand, it does not spare even the uh, small tubular bones. And also notice the segmental pattern on the medial side, namely the fifth metacarpal is not involved, the fourth metacarpal is not involved, partially the third metacarpal is involved, and mostly the first and second metacarpals, as well as the rays extending into the phalanges. And then we come to the multiple epiphyseal dysplasias. The dysplasia is only in the epiphysis. Ossification centers of hips, knees and ankles are the common sites. Multiple fossa of calcification are noted. And then again, please do not mistake this to the so-called calcifications, epiphyseal calcifications. Because this is calcification going on into the ossification where it is defective and delayed appearance of the bones or, or epiphyseal centers. In the spine, you may find small nodes 
but it is uh, really not significant. Small snorts is not uh, uh, a real pathological term unless it involves diffusely the entire spine. Premature degenerative changes, obviously, because the it ends at the articular margin of the joint, naturally degenerative changes occur. Classical example, look at the distal ends of the tibia, defective ossification in the lateral segment. Medial segment is normal. Spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, sometimes this entity is restricted to the epiphysis, sometimes entire spine also may be involved. Look at the apophyseal centers and irregularity of the articular ends of the vertebral bodies. This is typical of dysplasia, but then when you associate it with peripheral bones, it is spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Same thing in an infant, look at the irregularity of the ends of the bones, particularly the vertebral bodies. And as I said earlier, when the adolescence reaches the middle age or old age, degenerative changes occur. Degenerative changes at the articular ends of the bones. Because earlier, the epiphysis were deficient. As the child grows into adolescent, adolescent to middle age, these premature degenerative changes do occur, namely the narrowing of the joint space, irregular hibernation of the articular ends, and osteophyte formation. Same thing in the spine. If you look at the hips, again, notice the osteophytes and degenerative changes. Spine again, note the articular irregularities and almost simulating the so-called Schoerman's disease. Schoerman's disease generally occurs in the juvenile age. This is also called juvenile kyphosis. Here there is no kyphosis and yet the changes are noted in the articular ends of the bones. Now there is another entity which we have described earlier from Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences called the spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia with polyarthropathy. Clinically, the child or the adolescent comes with spindle shaped swellings of the joints and the painful joints. You would immediately think it must be a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. But then, radiologically, as we said, it simulates rheumatoid arthritis. But there is no paraarticular osteoporosis, there are absolutely no erosions of the bones. And large metacarpal heads because of the hyperemia and soft tissue swellings as though it is simulating rheumatoid arthritis. Notice this, the osteoporosis is there, irregularity of the epiphysis and some spiking at the metaphysical ends. And then look at the hands, mostly the changes are at the distal ends of the radius, in the epiphysis only. There is no paraarticular osteoporosis. The carpal bones are short but not like in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and there are absolutely no ch changes, namely erosions in the interphalangeal joints or in the metacarpophalangeal joints. Again, in a late stage, at this stage, frankly, to come to a differential diagnosis is difficult. What do you find here? The patient is about 30 years old. Already the epiphysis are closed. And yet, if you look at the epiphysis, there is asymmetry between the medial and lateral condyles. That's because of the uh, earlier, remember, the ankles, the medial ends of the epiphysis are irregular. Supposing it fuses, naturally this type of deformity occurs. Then we come to the metaphysial dysostosis. This is rather a confusing uh, entity because there are several types, several authors, namely Schmidt, Jamson, Mekusik and others have described these. Um, each one is like uh, five blind men describing an elephant. Because they saw certain uh, features in the hip joints and ankle joints and they described them. Somebody saw changes in the apophysis of the spine and then they described another entity. This is uncommon but uh, each one has described so so far 10 varieties of uh, uh, metaphysical chondrodysplasia have been described. And often this may be confused with mucopolysaccharidosis or mucolipidosis also. And then look at this uh, metaphysical dysostosis, non-union, as if it is simulating fractures. 
as compared with epiphyseal dysplasia, the epiphysis and articular margins are normal. The, all the changes are at the metaphysis, at the junction of the capital femoral epiphysis and the neck. And here also, as if, uh, we have described spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, here also the spine, when it is involved, you call it spondylometaphyseal dysplasia. And this is another with peripheral joint involvement and the spine. Now we come to the peripheral disastosis. The disastosis is only confined to the hands and feet, no other joints. And this is why they call it acromelic type of dwarfism. Naturally, the hands and feet are short. Look at the metatarsal bones. They are short and premature fusion of the epiphysis. That's why they are short. And they are uniformly short, bilateral, symmetrical. Again, another foot. And please note, there are about at least 10 to 12 entities where we can get short metacarpals including hypoparathyroidism, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, Turner syndrome, Noonan syndrome like that. But here, they are bilateral and symmetrical. And almost all the metatarsal bones and metacarpals are involved. Again, another in adult. Already the patient had some goatee changes and hallux, uh, hallux formation. But yet, if you look at the bones, tubular bones of the metatarsals, they are short. Now we come to the so-called fragile bones or osteogenesis imperfecta. This entity in a child, you can even diagnose by ultrasonographic methods in the intrauterine life of the fetus. And there again, there are four types. Type 1 is the mild blue sclera. Classically, we are all told in the textbooks in the moment you read about osteogenesis imperfecta or you see the patient, you have to look into the blue sclera. Blue sclera, they are not constant. Only in type 1 you see. And then type 2, prenatal and lethal. Invariably, uh, the child is delivered, it is lethal. The child does not survive. And then type 3, again uncommon, most uncommon and very severe type. Type 4, it, un it is uncommon, but often particularly in adults and older people, it resembles type 1, namely, it's mild, it has got blue sclera. And then what are the radiological findings? It's a variable spectrum. As we said earlier, intrauterine recognition, because there are fractures, sometimes there are healing fractures, sometimes there are loosened bones, absolutely, as if it is a phantom bone. You can draw a pencil line, in the cortex, and there is nothing else in the spongiosa. Unossified skull bones, remember the vermin bones we are describing, they are also common in these uh, uh, entities. Basilar impression, and then in the epiphyseal ends, you find some typical rounded calcifications, looking like a popcorn type of calcification. And then the vertebrae are always compressed and shorted. Look at this, in an infant, almost a newborn, and look at the fractures, some of them healing, some of them are about to heal, and then there is callus formation, not only the callus and fractures, look at the deformities, because these bones are gracile, the deformities, look at the fractures in the ribs also. Again, notice fractures, healing fractures at uh, mid shafts of the femora, and also in the clavicles and ribs. Again, another variety, but here also severe types of fractures in both femora and other tubular bones. This is a little older child, namely a teenager, 14 year old child. If it, it looks all like osteomalacia, bending of the bones, but in osteomalacia, you get a ground glass type of appearance, and then you get loser's zones or pseudo fractures, whereas here, marked bowing of the femora. Almost you can cross the legs. And then we are describing about vermian bones, multiple bones with intersutural lines. They are not fused. That is another typical example of osteogenesis imperfecta. 
remember the popcorn type of calcifications is the lower end of the femur look at these multiple dense rounded calcifications and then as i said earlier there is a tarda form a delayed lazy form which you find in adults 40 years 50 years you may find osteogenesis imperfecta tarda this is another uh, 30 year old boy look at the already there have been fractures and again there are callus formation and there is a cross fusion between the fibula and tibia as though nature supports the weak bone by the callus formation and cross fusion synostosis it is in the spine by lateral symmetrical fractures at the posterior ends of the ribs and also notice the compressed type of vertebrae and then there are several miscellaneous syndromes i will go briefly with few of them one is achondroplasia it is the most common type of dwarfism that we see in day to day practice this is the rhizomelic dwarfism because at the roots it is shortened the bones are tubular bones are like dumbbells and it is in a child in the newborn also you can see short tubular bones and look at the if you look at the arm it is the proximal segment that is short the forearms are all right again the spine same similar changes short and wedge shaped uh, vertebrae it is a older child there is kyphoscoliosis formation and then you also find the ribs uh, minor deformity it's very subtle as if they are crowded then we come to the conradi huerman syndrome where you find stippled epiphysis it is also called stippled epiphysis stippled epiphysis you will see in other entities like hypothyroidism or cretinism but this particular entity involves all the epiphysis including the apophysis also notice in the proximal and distal ends of the femora iliac bones and the vertebrae this is a, see spontaneously they can heal they don't require any type of treatment you for you tender the child with the loving care i mean eventually they spontaneously disappear and another newborn child with multiple calcific densities same thing with the uh, feet look at the tarsal centers multiple calcific densities one important differentiating point here is if the mother is treated say for uh, mitral stenosis with warfarin or cumidin the child may get such a stippled epiphysis also so one has to get proper history from the patient again tarsus multiple calcific densities in the wrist look at the carpal bones as if there are spots and then we will come to ellis van creffeld syndrome in fact in india we were the one first to describe in two children this syndrome one uh, one child was admitted in nilofar hospital another uh, child came to usmania general hospital i was uh, visiting nilofar hospital and working at uh, usmania then we have described myself and dr chodamani we described two cases these radiological findings hypoplastic distal phalanges post axial polydactyly if you look at the hands polydactyly is very important not only polydactyly syndactyly and syncarpus carpal bones are also fused and then pelvis is very small flat stapler roofs and 60% of these people or these children have some sort of a cardiac anomaly congenital heart disease mostly it is septal defects and either a single atrium or a large ast the this is also called mesomelic dwarfism because it's not the hands that are involved it's not the arms that are involved the forearms that's why it is called mesomelic dwarfism and look at the ends of the tubular bones look at the knees the if you look at the knees the legs are shorter the tibia and fibula whereas the femora are almost normal look at the polydactyly a bud from the fifth metacarpal bilateral and also not the mesomelic type of 
dwarfism and it is a 12 year old girl coming with the dyspnea and all the deformities for the hands look at the cardiomegaly and pulmonary arterial hypertension because the dilated main pulmonary artery and this is because of the large ast atrial septal defect or some second of time this is the drawing then we come to the last entity which is uh, in my opinion most common type of entity and it could be monoastritic only one bone may be involved or it could be polyostrotic multiple bones but then when it is polyostrotic it is bilateral and almost symmetrical or one side is more dominant often occurs in girls and then there is a precocious puberty this is called fuller albright syndrome and then what are the characteristic features the most common part that is involved is the face and basic cranium and which is isolated or localized you find the lytic area the nice thick rind it occurs in the uh, bones of the skull it is almost described as a bone blister and then in the long bones the matrix of the bone namely the sponge of the bone looks smoky and then sometimes there is calcific matrix also in which case it is called fibrochondrodysplasia chondrous element also is added and then when it is aggressive it looks like an aneurysm or bone cyst or even a simple cyst or even malignancy not that malignancy does not occur it's a complication at an older age this is the lateral view of the elbow look at the lytic lesion in the proximal end of the radius look at the matrix it is ground glass smoky and there is a small pathological fracture also with thinning of the cortex again in the tibia there should be a differential diagnosis in the sense ossifying fibroma can also occur in the mid shaft of the tibia in children up to 12 years of age you can see and then third in the older people say in the 20 years 30 years there is what is called adamantinoma the differentiation between ossifying fibroma fibrous dysplasia and adamantinoma is very difficult but then you have to study carefully and ultimately probably even the pathologist unless he sees the radiographs he cannot really differentiate between one from the other in ossifying fibroma also you may get uh, smoky type of matrix simulating fibrous dysplasia and in fibrous dysplasia usually it's not just one bone not only that looking at one part of the bone you shouldn't say it is monoastrotic fibrous dysplasia you have to look at the entire skeleton what we call monoastrotic look at the skull or say fifth toe or fourth finger you may get other lesions also so looking at the entire skeleton is important in order to say it is polyostrotic it is fibrous dysplasia and then there are satellite lesions in fibrous dysplasia so also you see in adamantinoma in the older group again fibrous dysplasia mid shaft almost uh, looking like a ossifying fibroma is an older person another it is extending 2 or 3 cm in the proximal end of the radius also there are some changes in the proximal end of the ulna and frankly if you look at the entire bone there is a radius or ulna there is no question of a differential diagnosis bizarre appearance of the cortex thinning of the cortex smoky matrix these are some of the classical radiological findings of fibrous dysplasia look at the thoracic cage it looks as if the lesions are coin lesions in the lungs but you look carefully trace the ribs these are expansions of the ribs there's a nice cortex there and in the center there's a smoky cortex aneurysmal bones can occur but not in multiple uh, aneurysmal bones and another typical radiological findings is formerly described by a uk radiologist the shepherd's crook deformity the shepherd carries a stick it's a crooked stick the third deformity is seen in the proximal end of the femur and pathological fractures can occur 
and again this is polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia. Uh, look at the findings, expansion of the bone, thinning of the cortex. In some of the bones, some of the particularly in the digits, there are calcifications. This is, you can label it as fibrochondrodysplasia, but it in general is a fibrous dysplasia. Again, notice this. Um, there is diffuse involvement of the shaft of the tibia and fibula, multiple osteolytic areas, not at one, one corner. Typical of fibrous dysplasia, but occasionally you may mistake this for Paget disease. Paget disease is not as common as fibrous dysplasia. And not only that, look at the facial bones, the mandible, the bone islands, as well as the multiple lytic areas. These are all classical. Look at the base, marked sclerosis, almost the frontal and maxillary sinuses are obliterated. And in fact, if you look at the patient, he, he can be described particularly if it involves the facial bones, leantosis osseum, namely lion looking facies because of the deformity of the face due to hypertrophy of the bones and fibrous dysplasia. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have briefly gone through some of the skeletal dysplasias. As I have stressed upon, the terms are confusing, sometimes overlapping terms, uh, disastosis and dysplasia, they are overlapping terms and definitions are also are not that clear cut. But one thing is clear, they are all either congenital or developmental. It, they can be seen in intrauterine life until 60 or 70th year of life. Occasionally complications may occur, particularly in fibrous dysplasia, namely fibrosarcoma can occur, osteosarcoma can occur, malignant fibrous osteocytoma can occur. So with those complications, the patient may die off prematurely. Otherwise, in order to make a radiological diagnosis, clinically some of them may resemble one another. But radiological diagnosis, there are definite radiological signs one has to analyze, observe. And as I told earlier, you may have to see the entire skeleton, then only you can come to a reasonable.